Um, so seven to eight years. Oh, okay. I guess you're streaming now? Yes, we are live now. Um, welcome uh, everyone uh, to the Center for Social and Economic Progress, CSEP, uh, here in Delhi, uh, virtually uh, in this mode. My name is Constantino Xavier, and I'm a fellow at uh, CSEP, where I lead also the Samband Initiative on Regional Connectivity. Uh, welcome all, and uh, good afternoon from Delhi. Good evening to those who are joining us towards the east uh, in Asia. Good morning to those that are joining us from the west, in particularly one of our panelists, Akriti Vasudeva, who's calling in all the way from Washington, D.C., where, where it is 6 a.m., uh, delighted to host a session here today with all of you over the next uh, hour and a half to discuss a new publication uh, by my colleague Sanit Chakradeo, who's a research analyst at CSEP. Uh, Sanit authored a brief titled Neighborhood First Responder, India's Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief. This has been out now for a couple of months uh, on our website, if you haven't read it still and is part of a series of policy primers, uh, short sort of 5,000 words pieces uh, that we're trying to bring out on various aspects of uh, regional cooperation, regional connectivity, regional integration in South Asia uh, in a very holistic approach towards many dimensions of, of regional connectivity, not the traditional ones only like investment, trade, infrastructure, but also issues like these in terms of the capacity of the countries in this region to respond in a coordinated way to a variety of challenges in the form of natural calamities, disasters, emergencies uh, affect, affecting, affecting this region. A special welcome to our guests, our three guest speakers joining us for this panel here today. Uh, first, Colonel Arjun Katoch, who's a member of the advisory committee at the National Disaster Management Authority here in India. Uh, second, Captain Salabjit Parmar, who's the executive director at the National Maritime Foundation, also here in Delhi. Uh, Akriti Vazudeva, research analyst with the South Asia program at the Stimson Center uh, Research Institution in Washington, DC. Uh, I'll introduce each of these three in a bit more detail uh, uh, later at this point. I just like to emphasize that we could not, uh, uh, um, we, we were not, we are not uh, joined by uh, the Joint Secretary of the Development Partnership Administration that looks at these issues in the Ministry of External Affairs. She regretted not being able to attend this event, but certainly we have, I think, tremendous expertise here to address these issues from various uh, angles, including also the diplomatic foreign policy angle. Uh, three quick notes, I think, to introduce this issue a bit more and explain also why we came up with this publication. I think the first point is clear that with greater regional interdependence in this region and, and worldwide, crisis response has to become much faster and much more sophisticated. So governments will have to respond in a much more agile um, and sophisticated way to many of these crises. This is not just longer business about food and medical relief. This is now uh, a response that needs to be much more complex, uh, technically prepared to a variety of disasters, emergencies that are A, more frequently and costly, for example, climate change and its various manifestations in terms of cyclones that are becoming more frequent, for example, in the Bay of Bengal region, but also more diverse and complex issues of cybersecurity, terror attacks that also require immediate response from several countries to uh, support the affected countries. A second issue I think that makes this also more important these days is mm. India's ambition signaled politically above all and in speeches and in commitments at the highest level by the prime minister, by the external affairs minister over the last few years, that India wants to become a first responder. This is a loaded term, a strong term, obviously, but it uh, puts on India the onus as part of its neighborhood first policy to respond first, to be prepared to step into action and to support its neighboring countries in particular uh, in their responses to these various crises. So we can think of the 2015 Nepal earthquake where India played an important, uh, albeit sometimes also criticized role the Sri Lanka terror attacks in 2019, where India shared immediate intelligence on several of the perpetrators, but also the current pandemic in which we are in now, uh, which has seen India taking up a very proactive step in sharing medical relief and also uh, uh, coordinating a variety of uh, um, 
responses to, res to the pandemic affecting the region. Finally, let me just make one caveat I think that is important in all of this discussion. Um, you know, we can talk about capacity, expertise, coordination to respond. But one thing, you know, many people, I think in government keep telling us outsiders who are working on this is that there's no perfect blueprint for any crisis. A crisis is generally unannounced. A crisis is generally new in different manifestations, regionally, different locations, different nature of the crises. But I think having said that, we do need more research about India's capacity uh, to respond to these crises and an Indian approach to crisis response uh, in four different directions. One is just the basic research on the experience and the possibility of institutionalizing memory, which is very important. What has worked, what has not in the past. In Nepal 2015, for example, we've had India involved in uh, uh, problematic coverage of the media, uh, coordination issues. So often there are lessons that can be learned from the past. Second, what are the definitions of these emergencies? It's a big discussion, but definition itself is changing um, as we speak. And I think the pandemic has once again illustrated this in a very particular way. And finally, internal coordination issues. There are many, many different agencies and organizations across the Indian government and in different governments in the neighborhood that are dealing with these emergencies from the prime minister's office, the Ministry of External Affairs, the Ministry of Home in the case of India, the National Disaster Man Management Authority, the armed forces with its three services, regional states of India that often have their own relief funds for neighboring countries, and finally NGOs and civil society that also play an important role in supporting neighboring countries and civil societies to respond to these emergencies. So I think what we'll do today is I'll quickly tell you what, we, what our structure is gonna be. Sanit is going to present briefly uh, his research paper in a few slides to remind us of what his main findings are. And then we'll follow up with a discussion with our three guest experts and open this up also to the many participants who are joining us. So for the participants, uh, the reminder is that if you want to share, ask any questions or have any comments, please do share them with your affiliation so I can read them out and share them and address them to any specific speaker. So in your chat box, please uh, uh, feel free to share any of your questions um, so we can have this also as a more interactive discussion. Okay, having said that, I think I'll pass the word now to uh, Sanit uh, Chakradeo, who's our research analyst and will briefly present the main findings of his policy brief. Sanit, up to you. Um, thank you, Tino. I'll just put up the presentation. Um, right. So uh, as Tino mentioned, uh, this brief is part of uh, CSEP's uh, Samban Regional Connecti Connectivity Initiative, wherein we track India's connectivity on in the region on various parameters. Uh, basically, the motivation for the study uh, was many fold. Firstly, uh, as Tino mentioned, South, uh, South Asia as a region is particularly vulnerable to natural disasters. And uh, COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has sort of, it, it sort of indicates the changing nature of threats that the region faces. Um, secondly, um, India's HADR operations have overwhelmingly been directed towards the neighborhood. So uh, according to one estimate, about two thirds of India's uh, assistance has been uh, diverted to uh, South Asia. And as Tino mentioned um, in the official rhetoric, India has signaled its intent to be the region's first responder for emergencies. Uh, so the basic objective for the study was to um, analyze this uh, thought and practice, HEDR in thought and practice, and also map its various dimensions, bilateral, multilateral, and other forms of assistance that India has provided in the neighborhood. So the key takeaway from the study was that India has had considerable success. India's HEDR program has had success, but uh, in order to further leverage goodwill from its assistance in the neighborhood, uh, there needs to be an improvement firstly in the internal processes and internal coordination uh, between the different branches of government agencies um, and um, also between state governments and civil society, uh, which, is also, which also plays a significant role in providing uh, relief. Um, and secondly, uh, India's largely bilateral approach 
uh, in providing relief uh, india will do good to move uh, sort of beyond that and look uh, towards multilateral agencies and international organizations to sort of diversify its approach uh, in part also to placate its smaller neighbors uh coming to uh, methodology uh, india does not have a designated hdr policy and thus it does not adhere to a specific hdr definition uh but in its practice it has uh, provided relief uh, in in the aftermath of disasters and also conflict so in for the brief i used the definitions by the oecd and the un uh which basically makes a distinction between uh, the long term development cooperation uh which is which uh, pro is provided uh over years and uh hdr in that sense or humanitarian assistance in that sense distinguishes uh, uh, itself from it by being short term or only in the aftermath of disasters uh and the sources that i used to uh, compile this data uh, were uh ministry of external affairs annual reports uh ministry of defense annual reports um uh, union budgets other reports and also um i used a un financial tracking services database uh, which compiles all assistance provided by year and donors as reported to the un right so as i mentioned uh, india does not have a designated hdr policy and it categorizes humanitarian assistance under the larger umbrella of development cooperation uh this is evident from uh, the fact that there's a separate line item for aid for disaster oh we lost sanit can you hear him no right oh there you are go on sanit right just a second right sorry for that um right um and um, also uh, the fact that uh, in in the red, in its rhetoric again india uh, tends to emphasize more on um uh respecting the territorial sovereignty of the affected country or uh, its neighbors um lastly uh, as a result of this india engages mostly bilaterally with countries on hdr and uh, this is again uh, something that needs to be looked at in detail so coming to the various agencies that are involved uh, the nodal point of contact for all relief operations uh, is the mea dpa2 division uh, the division coordinates with uh, various high commissions and embassies uh, abroad and also internally with uh, the ministry of defense and also the ministry of home affairs under which falls the ndma uh, coming to uh, of a uh, key bilateral operations uh, by policy brief analyzes uh, bilateral operations across 20 years the last 20 years 2000 to 2019 uh, and i track uh, every instance of relief provided details of what the relief for, what kind of relief was provided and also the assets deployed um and from the last 20 years two relief operations stand out in in its in their impact one was the 2004 and 5 indian ocean tsunami which uh, sort of set the tone for india's operations in the neighborhood um they uh, paved the way uh, they marked a shift in sorts of india's capabilities um, or the perceptions in india's capabilities in hdr um, and also the 2015 nepal earthquake which india claims to be its largest ever relief operation abroad um as i mentioned india's uh, assistance has overwhelmingly been bilateral um, and even then uh, it continues to profess its support for uh, the global humanitarian system and it has endorsed the un as the primary uh, or the desired agency to coordinate assistance in this regard um, so even though in in rhetoric it supports uh, this uh, global humanitarian regime but um, it it has not yet translated to a substantial increase in support in terms of in kind contributions or direct contributions uh, some major noteworthy contributions have been made to for example the world food program and also the central emergency response fund uh, 
um but uh, the the quantum of support provided through these organizations is uh, uh, not comparable to the overwhelmingly bilateral donations another avenue that uh, india has uh, leveraged is uh, through regional mechanisms but it has had limited success uh, the primary regional uh, institution in south asia is sarc and it has the most uh, sort of established disaster management or cooperation regime uh, mainly in the form of an agreement on rapid response to natural disasters which was, which was signed in 2011 um and also the establishment of the sarc food bank which was uh, finalized in 2007 uh, but the fact that there hasn't been even a single uh, a contingent sarc level contingent that has been deployed in times of emergencies in the region uh, that sort of tells us how effective these uh, measures have been uh, also to note that even though uh, the sarc food bank was finalized in 2007 uh its first sort of transaction took place this year in 2020 uh the other uh, alternative is bimstech uh many thought bimstech to be this sort of antidote to the political tensions that plague sarc and also the reason why it's ineffective but bimstech in itself has not been as effective either there have been a few initiatives uh, there's uh, the center for weather and climate that was established in india uh there have also been disaster management exercises but again there is there has been uh, a severe gap in setting up for example standard operating procedures or even um, uh fine tuning of joint exercises um and thirdly there's there have been partnerships in the indian ocean region so uh there are two prominent organizations uh, namely uh, the indian ocean rim Org- association and also the indian ocean naval symposium Uh, through which there were some sops that were uh, finalized and india also uh, was the chair for the core group on disaster risk management for iora but uh, even after these uh, sort of well meaning initiatives uh, we don't see or uh, perceive them as uh, uh, sort of the primary agencies carry out relief operations in the region lastly coming to the recommendations uh the first sort of ov- overarching recommendation that uh, uh i make in the brief is, uh there needs to be a standard procedure or coordination needs to be institutionalized internally within uh, the various agencies or the government uh while dpa2 is the nodal agency there Uh, it it does require greater expert uh, expertise and financial resources through some of the uh, expert interviews that i carried out this was the point that came out the most uh, one option is to centralize efforts in the neighborhood under the nsa uh, which a few countries have done or have utilized uh, but uh, this can certainly be an option that can be looked at uh secondly uh, in order to uh, diversify its portfolio or uh, to s- sort of placate the uh, apprehensions that india's smaller neighbors have of india unilaterally embarking on relief operations on their shores uh, india can look at uh, firstly investing in regional mechanisms namely sarc poses the most opportunity in that sense uh, given that it has the most well established uh, mechanisms uh, but also international initiatives uh, a straightforward way to do that is uh, in increasing in kind contributions and also donations to uh, the world food program for example or to the cerf uh, and lastly deepening of the indian ocean regional partnerships so uh, lately the quad has gained prominence uh, in the region and um, a good way to sort of build a soft security dimension to the cord could be a focus on hadr uh, apart from the cord there have been bilateral dialogues that have taken place for example india just uh, finalized an agreement with uh, singapore on hadr so there are other players in the region apart from the cord which india can look at engaging with for example um, asean or uh, france and the european union even and that's about it thank you Thank you Sanit for this uh, uh concise overview of your research and your publication. 
Um, I think I'll just move directly to the panel and to the uh, guest, speak, uh, guest speakers we have here today to share um, their feedback on, on your work. Uh, let me introduce first uh, Colonel Arjun Katoch, who uh, was commissioned to the Parachute Regiment of the Indian Army in 1967. Uh, Colonel Katuch joined the United Nations in 93, uh, where he worked with the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, O-C-H-A, until he retired from there in 2009. Uh, in his position at OCHA, he was responsible for managing the United Nations Disaster Assessment and Coordination uh, and the International Search and Advisory Group. Uh, so on that, he ensured work uh, for various emergency responses under the United Nations uh, to around 140 disasters worldwide. He's been deployed to almost all major international disasters in the last 15 years over the 2000s, 90s, 2000s, including the Indian Ocean tsunami, the Pakistan earthquake, and the cyclone Nargis in Myanmar. Uh, sir, up to you. Thank you. Um, it's a very interesting paper, and I'm very glad that Sunit came out with it because I think this is a field which in India is uh, very understudied, should I say. And, and therefore, there's a certain amount of ignorance both within government as well as in the academic world on these issues. To begin with, just the title of the paper, H-A-D-R. H-A-D-R uh, is a military term. In fact, it was uh, originated in the US military. So that itself uh, shows the, should I say, difference that ought to be because when you are studying a nation's response to international emergencies, HADR um, is in my view, not quite the appropriate thing because it mixes up response during conflicts, response during other emergencies. Uh, in, and in this paper I've seen, he's even covered stuff like the 1971 war to Bangladesh, and then you've got cyber warfare and, and things of that sort. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. And I think that's the root cause of some of the issues which he has stressed on in uh, Indian disaster response. The uh, lack of clarity and, and Sanit has brought that out within the government of India on what should be their policy and their processes for responding outside India. Uh, there is no doubt that India, like many other countries, relies very heavily on its military for response abroad. But then on the other hand, the military till very recently was not should I say, exposed to international response practices and would not participate in things like the regional coordination group of, uh, of, of, the, of the Asia Pacific region. So I think the paper itself has touched on all the major issues, uh, bearing in mind the limitations that exist within our own system internally. I'm not too sure that uh, we should not have given more emphasis on the fact that plenty of international coordination mechanisms exist, which India does not participate in. And, and to reinvent the wheel, it, it makes no sense to me. To say that we should create a new response mechanism in SARC or in BIMSTEC or something like that, when OCHA has some very, very long-standing agreed international coordination response mechanisms which we are not participating in the way we ought to. Uh, it, it's also complicated by the fact that there are many common members between SARC, BIMSTEC, ASEAN, and, and so who, what, what do we do? So that's the other uh, issue. I, I also want to, to bring out uh, the fact that any international response is a political act. And we cannot divorce the politics of international response from the humanitarian uh, part of it, much as we would like to, or much as anyone profess that they do, they don't. Most of it is with, uh, you know, with whatever interests in mind. And I wish that had been brought out a, a bit more in this paper. Some of the recommendations um, I personally think the one about coordination is absolutely correct, internal coordination within the government of India, uh, and it needs to be rethought. 
I wonder how many people know that till 2002, disaster response or disaster management in India was dealt with by the Ministry of Agriculture, not by anybody else. And this is a leftover of, of course, the British rule and the fact that famines used to be uh, the big thing. It's only in 2002 that disaster management was transferred from the Ministry of Agriculture, where a relief commissioner used to deal with it, to the Ministry of Home Affairs after the Bhuj earthquake. So we, within the government of India, there is also development of thought, and that's taking place. But it needs to move at a slightly faster pace. Uh, as far as the military is concerned, for international response, they are the primary instrument, but the military itself is not fully plugged in to international civil military coordination. And that requires a certain effort. Uh, I think there were many years wasted when, um, at least 10 years, when we were very shy of allowing our military to um, interact with foreign militaries. So that needs to be uh, resolved somewhat. And, and finally, one recommendation which he made, which I totally disagree with, I mean, is the whole business of uh, centralizing it under the NSA or, or something of that sort. No, this is a MEA issue and it has to get solved within MEA and within the government by centralizing it under an NSA or, or, or something like that is not going to help because ultimately it's a political issue dealing with foreign affairs. So I think I'll just stop there. Thank you, uh, Colonel Katuch. Excellent. If I may quickly follow up on these last two things. I mean, one is, why was India so reluctant in joining these various international initiatives? Um, I think no one better than you to t illustrate why it took, why it is taking and why it took India so long to be more proactive on the multilateral front, in including on the United Nations instruments, which it professes as sort of a central element of its foreign policy. That's an interesting question. I think part of the uh, part of the mental outlook is a hangover of the Nehruvian years, where bilateralism was the, was the mantra, and the world has changed. So that's one. The second thing is that I think there was a suspicion of some of the UN agencies, especially OCHA because OCHA also dealt with conflict response and uh, probably did not want uh, to get too close to agencies which could then perhaps comment on issues which were within India or as well. So I suspect that it's a, the third thing is that even within India, there was no real focal point dealing with disaster management. I told you the Ministry of Agriculture was dealing with it till 2002. They're not interested in what's happening outside. And even when it got transferred to the uh, Ministry of Home Affairs and the Disaster Management Act of 2005 came up, the MEA was on the periphery and they were on their own trip of bilateral response and uh, development assistance. This didn't figure. And finally, I think we lack domain knowledge and we have not developed domain knowledge on this issue within this country and especially within its government. And then on the second front, uh, Colonel Katuj, if I may stay on, with you on, on the second issue is um, on the coordination front. You make the case for the Ministry of External Affairs, but as it stands today, the Ministry of External Affairs has a limited budget line for HADR. Frankly, it often itself is not sure about what exactly is HADR, which both you and Sanita think brought out. Sometimes, you know, in, in, the, in the continuum of relief, rehabilitation, reconstruction, it becomes very, very ambiguous of what India is doing and where those budget lines are going. In fact, Sanita was struggling a lot with that. And often people that are working on these issues themselves don't know. But if the MEA doesn't have that capacity to, I mean, in that sense, my, my question is the MEA, in many ways is uh, centralizing between territorial divisions in the diplomatic system. But how do you expect the MEA to be able to coordinate uh, the military services um, and other bodies in the Indian uh, government that are also very critical in these responses? And sometimes in a, in a question of hours, as you know, sir, it is, has to be done. Yeah. And as far as I see, at least I don't see that MEA capacity at all. And I think that's the case that it was making for centralization at a more political, higher level. 
PMO, NSC, I, I don't know, many possibilities in different countries? Okay, there are two issues within your question. One is within MEA itself. Uh, within MEA, uh, issues are dealt with on a regional basis. You have regional divisions, uh, humanitarian response and disaster relief and things of that sort. The decisions are not taken by DPA2. The decisions are taken by a regional uh, division along with its secretary and the ambassador in the country and various things of that sort. So their internal processes firstly need to be uh, streamlined somewhat if you want to have. Second, we do not have any uh, nodal institution which retains domain knowledge on processes, on coordination internationally and things of that sort. We need to have an interagency cell which could be located within MEA where people don't change every two years and push off uh, and go to some diplomatic post. And this should be, this should consist of not only diplomats, it must also have in it representatives of the armed forces, as well as, I would even say people like the Indian Red Cross, because you, you need to have a multidisciplinary cell, which creates institutional knowledge and keeps it. The, the second part, which you dealt with, uh, you spoke about is decision making. Well, actually, when India wants to, it can make decisions very fast. I responded to the Nepal earthquake as part of the UN disaster assessment coordination team. And in fact, I took a ride with one of the Air Force C-17s taking NDRF there. But if you remember, that decision was taken by the prime minister. And the statement he made was that the response to the Nepal earthquake in Nepal will be no different from a response to an earthquake in India. And that one decision with that, all the same agencies you're talking about, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Home Affairs, NDRF comes under them, NDMA, Air Force, Army, all responded in such a way that in six hours, we had search and rescue teams from NDRF in Kathmandu. So it's not that we can't do it. It's not that we cannot take political decisions and execute them. We do not have a institutionalized known method of doing so. Thank you, sir. Um, I think on the note of civil military coordination, no one better yeah. than next <laughs> to take this forward than uh, Captain Parmar from the National Maritime Foundation. Uh, sir, if I may quickly uh, say a few lines about your long and distinguished career in the Navy, but also in the intellectual domain of the Navy in terms of its strategic thinking uh, and the Navy having, of course, taken a very important role on HADR and emergency responses in the neighborhood since the 2000s in particular. Uh, Captain Parmar is an alumnus of the National Defense Ca Academy in Karak Karakvashla and Defense Services Staff College in Wellington. Uh, he was commissioned into the Indian Navy in 1987. Uh, he served as Joint Director Naval Plans in the Director of Naval Planning at the Integrated Headquarters, Ministry of Defense and also been a directing staff at DSSC in Wellington. Uh, two particular things stand out, I think, in, in his recent experience that I'd like to highlight. One is between 2014 and 16, he was director uh, on strategy in the director of strategy concepts and transformation at the Ministry of Defense uh, Navy as part of the core team that revised Indian Navy's unclassified maritime security strategy document and doctrine which has several references to HADR, non-combatant evacuation operations to support the diaspora, et cetera. Uh, the second position was between 2016 and 18 um, as a director for strategic maritime assessments and doctrine development. He carried out regional maritime assessments and completed the doctrine, the doctrine development plan. Uh, currently, Captain Parmar is executive director at the NMF here in Delhi. Captain Parmar, over to you. Thank you, Constantino, and uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon to wherever you are sitting today. And Akriti needs a cup of coffee. She's been awake since I think for the last uh, one hour, five thirty your time. But just a quick uh, reference to a certain a number of issues before I get into the uh, civil military combined is that, um, in fact, you made me revisit the paper I wrote in 2012 because I'm a little foggiest what I had written out there. So if you look at uh, uh, how does India look at HADR? Now, this stems from the fact that most of the nations who got independence after World War II 
were colonized nations. So they had a little different view of the Western approach. And therefore, India generally, the typical Asian view of HDR is a political, decentralized, and most often taking a bilateral government to government approach. This is what I wrote in my paper. And this also stems from the fact that it's respect for sovereignty of the government in power in that particular nation. And therefore, the territorial sovereignty, which uh, Sanit mentioned, comes into play. And this respect of this aspect is what has gained India's trust, or many nations trust India to be what we call now the first responder, and also the term which we are now using as the preferred security partner. Because in many places, you'll find India is most more welcome than many other nations in the world. And this, you've got to compare the OECD approach and all, where uh, even uh, the definition for HADR as far as India is concerned, is addressing natural calamities, whereas the Western view also encompasses human conflict. And therefore, I'm not going to get into the debate of R2P, but I will give you just one example. Uh, Constantino mentioned uh, Cyclone Nargis. At that point in time, you must understand, Myanmar was just opening its doors to the world when it was hit by this uh, cyclone. And India was one of the few nations, or maybe the first nation, who was permitted to provide assistance. And you had France who tried to invoke R2P against Myanmar. Now, when you have this sort of an approach, how do you come out with a conjoined HADR? But this was many years back or many moons back. But the fact of the matter is that India is trusted to be a first responder. And we've seen it in, this, uh, in the assistance given uh, for the COVID situation. right? But in this case, when you look at HADR, you can divide it into two parts. One is the humanitarian assistance part and one is the disaster relief. So in a way, what Sanit is looking at is more of the disaster relief part. The humanitarian assistance, what he called maybe was the 71 example he gave, or even if we look at non-combatant evacuation operations or NEO as the militaries call them, they are also a small part of HADR, but they come under the issue of areas of instability. It may not necessarily may be a disaster prone area, but there may be a case where the area is unstable and the disaster is hit, then what do you do? then it becomes a combination. So making an SOP or making a method of approaching, and as was clearly brought out, that each situation is different. And I can tell you that because uh, being a helicopter pilot, the amount of uh, HDR operations within India have been involved in this phenomenon. And each one has been different. So I thought I'd lay this out here. And insofar as the first responder is concerned, there are a few aspects that we must look at. One is, when I specifically speak of the Navy, is that the mission-based deployments which we have. And I'll give you an example, is that we had ships of uh, proceeding towards South Africa when we had the cyclone that hit uh, Mozambique. So the ships just turned right and proceeded straight away. And one lesson we've learned from the 2004 tsunami is the fact that all ships, when they sail out, also sail out with a brick of HADR, so that they don't have to return back to harbor. They are available for immediate assistance. The other issue I, example I can give you is Malaysia. When the earthquake hit Malaysia, we had uh, ships transiting through, proceeding on to uh, deployment across the South China Sea. And they were just asked to turn right and provide assistance. In fact, they were the first to arrive off the scene even before the Malaysian uh, authorities could act together. Because it's a mere known fact that when calamity hits, the first thing that is hit is accessibility. And this is where I come on to why the military. You need to get to that place fast enough. And because if I'm correct, and Sanit, you can correct me, or even Akriti can correct me, is the first 24 to 48 hours are crucial. If you want to save lives, you have to get into the next first 24, 48 hours. Who has that type of organization? Who has that type of capacity, capability, or training, speed of deployment? And more importantly, the ability to adapt and, be, and the versatility of operations. The world over it is a military. When you look even at the US, most of the first reactions have been by the US military. Look at the world over. So that is why military, and this is where it comes in. And remember, HADR is a part of what, at least what in, in the Navy, what we call as a benign role. And therefore, this was a naval example. You add in the Air Force, the assets we have today, the numbers we have, you look at the Army deployment. And I think the best example is 2004 tsunami, where the military itself took a hit, but yet it was available and up and running to provide assistance to its neighboring areas. And if I remember my figures correctly, we sailed out 27 ships within the first 24 hours, not only providing assistance to our own people along the eastern coast, but also to other 
uh, island territories and also other affected nations. That was there. And insofar as the MEN military combine is concerned, I think more important than anything else is the mission on ground. Is that if there is an effective organization up and running on the mission on ground that can provide the information, then India or any other nation would be able to provide the exact requirement of relief. And there is one example I'll take out from the Bush earthquake, which Colonel Arjun Katoz mentioned, is that relief did pour in. But one food uh, allotment that came was corned beef. Now, <laughs> if you're supplying corn, there is a thought process that needs to be developed. And I think it has developed over a period of time, especially in so far as sensitivities are concerned. And that's something that needs to be clearly understood. And this is where it is important to see that what is it that is required? Is that who has the capacity, who has the capability? And I think uh, the 2004 tsunami or when the first time the quad got together and it took some time for things to move out. But if you are getting, well, as in NMF, we are fond of saying, if you get the tents, who gets the blanket? So if there has to be a certain divide and understanding. This will come only come with interoperability. And this is where the SOP or the IONS guidelines and the IORA guidelines come into place. And there are certain principles, and it's it's a 42-page document. Some of you would have gone through it. I know it's available. But there are certain points. First of all, the objective must be clearly defined. What is it that you are going to go for? What is it that you are going to execute on ground? Which are the teams that need to go? And this is where the issue comes about, is that even when the military reaches first, there has to be backup, backup coming as far as the civilian uh, entities are concerned. Because at a certain point in time, the military will have to withdraw. It cannot be there permanently. And this is when the first uh, situation, when the situation is addressed, when initial help has been given. You need a lot of stuff. You need metal detectors, you need sniffer dogs. I mean, the, the list is endless, whatever you want, depending upon the type of disaster that is there. But slowly you have to hand over to the civilian organizations, the military withdraws, and then comes the rehabilitation phase. And this is where that government to government unilateral, and I, I, I actually support that uh, thing that you need to ask the government, what is it that they want? And once you have given them what they want, let them do their own job. You cannot dictate terms. And this is something that is uh, why, again, I say that it is the Asian way of looking at HADR and the difference in the Western way. Then there's, of course, unity of effort comes into that. Then one thing which we haven't talked about, and Sunit, I don't think you mentioned is what happens if you have to do it in a hostile environment? To give you an example, if you're doing non-combatant evacuation operations, so far, India has been lucky that we've been able to go in and get our people out. The number of times we've done it, whether it was Yemen or whether it was Lebanon or whether it was any other country for that matter. But tomorrow, if you have to go with boots on ground, that is something that I think needs to be discussed. And that is some international requirement. And this is where the aspect of what comes in that when the quad develops, and this is something that is a benign issue and, and it can be looked at very suitably, apart from the other issues that come about there. More importantly, you need to train people to avoid provocation. There's a lot of restraint. There will be a lot of angst on ground. When we used to do the food dropping, we have actually seen, you know, riots taking place because we had enough food to drop, but the people are hungry. They are, they're not very happy because the system comes a little late. So, Avoid provocation. There's a lot of restraint. So the training and the mindset has to change. Then, of course, uh, neutrality. You should give equal importance to all recipients. This is, again, I get back to the point of uh, sovereignty, respect of sovereignty. Tailored to local requirements, simplicity. Your standardization of orders and procedures should be there. And this is where inter inter interoperability comes in. And in that aspect, when IONS, uh, the, India is the chair for the uh, working group on HDR, there have been a lot of exercises carried out and a lot of uh, nations have got involved. So we are getting there. But again, the question is, what is the capacity and capability? In this way, in the region, India has the advantage that we have geographical depth. Even if we are affected by the same calamity, you can still move your operations from a different area which is free of that calamity and therefore you're free to move. Other nations or surrounding nations are not so lucky to have the geographical depth. So that is why India, in a way, would be actually the first responder because it has the capacity and capability. And also, it also has the geographical depth in by which it can move operations forward. And therefore, it would be looked at as the preferred security partner. There are a lot of other issues that come in, Sanit, when you right. talk about, you know, who should do what. So this is the, where the issues come in is that MEA may be for uh, your assistance abroad. 
but if it's combined say within india and uh, abroad then you need to have some sort of a common committee going and in so far as budget is concerned the military budget would come from the military budget if if we are operating our ships aircraft and moving our troops is going to come from that it's not going to come from anywhere else so the mea budget per se is different so i think if you are referring to the government assistance that's given for rehabilitation and development then that will come from a separate pool of money and that is where the government comes in and therefore it's a political decision i am totally with colonel rajin patoj that we do not need to reinvent the wheel we need to strengthen the existing uh, establishments or the existing uh, procedures which we have but what we need to do is streamline and sop and if we are going to reach out to quad nations i would say why not look at quad plus then get other nations in and we know that the area of uh, the south china sea and especially the indian ocean region is rife with the uh, disasters i mean there was a time period when cyclones used to respect the seasons they used to come only in that season but nowadays they don't they just come any time they want and they go in any direction we had one which is tamil nadu coast and this is where uh, certain lessons india can give to other nations also that uh, i think last to last two years back when we had a cyclone that hit tamil nadu compared to the earlier unpreparedness we did not have a single loss of life which means our systems internally are working people get the message they play safe and especially fishermen at sea i mean there's more to cover about this but i'll pause here because i know constantino is just waiting to throw some questions at me and i think sanit also would like to ask it thank you i pause here for the time thank being. you captain parmano you mentioned quad plus so that's the perfect lead to our uh, colleague uh, uh, akriti uh, who to come in but i have one quick follow up question if you can address i i mean on on reinventing the wheel i think if i'm not right colonel katuch was mentioning also the international mechanisms and best practices that exist and i think his point was there's no need to reinvent them regionally now through bimstech that is doing exercises with the ndma etc and that uh in many ways the guidelines and best practices what has happened uh, uh that have worked internationally could be adopted or adapted here in india but your, my question to you is on on the welcomeness of of india and in fact we have a particular question from a uh, um former ambassador of nepal vijay kant karna who's saying that while the ndrf of india was welcome during the earthquake in 2015 it was uh, not uh, welcome during the current pandemic um because of its military character or possibly linkage to the military so to what extent do you agree that you know sometimes india is actually not welcome there are important political considerations i think sadeep mentions that lead to tensions that lead to a suspicion about military deployments particularly in the neighborhood maybe less in africa but certainly in countries like sri lanka bangladesh and nepal there will be particular scrutiny and concern about any type of military deployment from india yeah i agree with that so i think that was a one off case where uh, it depends upon the relations constitute between nation to nation but the fact is that if we gave assistance to nepal it was only after the nepalese government and said yes come and help otherwise we don't go in without uh, an invitation from the government in power and uh, so i think this was a case that needs to look in isolation given the relationships of india and nepal at that point in time otherwise uh, i don't think we can uh, we would have this problem in future and then if a government says no thank you i don't need help uh, we will not go it's as simple as that got it good so um let's move to uh, our third uh, co- uh, discussant of of uh, sanit's paper Uh, Kriti Vasudeva who's a research analyst with the South Asia program at Stimson Center in Washington DC. Uh, her research focuses on US India defense and strategic cooperation, geopolitics of South Asia and the Indo-Pacific and Indian foreign policy. She's also editor at large, or I think was, right, at Kriti at South Asian Voices and an online which is an online platform for strategic analysis on South Asia. An excellent act- actually excellent initiative South Asian Voices that I recommend to all of you. uh she has previously worked as a print journalist in india uh research had research positions at the embassy of india in washington dc and also at the institute for defense studies and analysis in new delhi uh she has an ma in asian studies from the elliot school of international affairs at george washington university uh akriti over to you thank you so much dino and thank you to the center for social and economic progress for inviting me um I was saying earlier that I'm really grateful to be a part of such a distinguished panel. I mean, I know it's a 6 a.m. for me, it's 7 a.m. now, but I've you know I've learned a lot from Colonel Katoch and from Captain Parmar. So it's really uh, you know my honor to be here, and congratulations to Sanita on a really um, I thought comprehensive and interesting paper on an important topic. 
Um, and I'll just, um, you know, put a caveat here and say that I think um, uh, Colonel Katocha and Captain Parmar have spoken from a practitioner uh, perspective, from an operational perspective. Um, and I'll try to talk more broadly about potential opportunities for multilateral cooperation. And these are very much uh, exploratory ideas that I also welcome feedback on. Um, but I'll just make sort of two uh, broad points. And, and, and most of my comments are focused on the disaster relief portion um, of uh, you know, this conversation. I think first is that uh, I agree with, with Sunit's assessment that India has over the last few years stepped up its commitment to disaster relief as a demonstration of its growing regional and leadership role uh, globally as well. So, you know, this has been a key area that's identified as a, a priority of India's policy towards its neighborhood, both at the political and military level. So um, I think Costino was mentioning this earlier, we've seen that at the highest political levels, uh, such as through Prime Minister Modi's endorsement of the idea of security and growth for all in the region, or what he's actually uh, termed as India using its capabilities for the benefit of uh, all in the common maritime home of the Indian Ocean region, uh, suggests that you know, th this is a, a priority for India, but also that this is apparent through uh, the Navy's uh, 2015 maritime security strategy, which also um, talks about uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief as a way of uh, reinforcing India's uh, you know, security credentials in, in the region and playing up its uh, benign role uh, that C Captain Parmar was talking about in order to achieve its objectives of, of soft power, uh, power projection. Uh, I think this was most recently visible in, in, in uh, India's regional response to the coronavirus pandemic, uh, as part of which is diplomacy included providing medical supplies and assistance to many of its neighbors, um, you know, including Sri Lanka, Maldives, Seychelles, Mauritius, uh, and also proposing the COVID emergency fund and information sharing under um, SARC. But globally as well, uh, India has been part of coordination efforts and sharing of best practices with, with fellow quad members uh, or um, you know, the extended Quad Plus, which includes obviously US, Japan, and Australia, but also Vietnam, South Korea, New Zealand, and some iterations have also included Brazil uh, and Israel. And, and this uh, effort is to address the, the global economic impacts of COVID and pool expertise to develop a, a coronavirus vaccine. So I think this indicates that India's uh, efforts are to position itself as a, a purveyor of public goods in the region, to gain uh, goodwill um, and as a responsible regional and global actor that's ready to take on more uh, responsibility, particularly as an aspirational leading power. Um, and I think one thing that I, I missed a little bit in Sanit's paper, uh, and I agree with Colonel Kadoch, is that um, I wish there was a little bit more of a discussion of kind of the geopolitical uh, interests and, and angle to this as well, because I think that this is especially relevant in India's role in disaster relief from the point of view of uh, India's um, sort of relationship with China and how the two um, are sort of competing in the, in the region, particularly with um, India having resource constraints and not necessarily able to offer huge investments and in economic development to these countries. But I think through disaster relief, which is less expensive and sort of more of an asymmetric uh, way of building, um, you know, trust and goodwill in the region, I think that that is actually something that, that India probably needs to focus a little bit more on. Uh, and the, the second broader point I, I wanted to make again was I think in support of uh, Sunit's recommendation in the paper of strengthening uh, the cooperation among the Quad countries on uh, disaster relief. So the Quad, like I said, which uh, comprises of uh, India, US, Japan, and Australia has disaster relief beginnings. It came about as an ad hoc grouping, which was uh, to coordinate responses to the Indian Ocean tsunami in December 2004. Uh, and at that time, actually, US officials had built it as a grouping that could provide public goods to the region. Um, and uh, disaster relief is actually considered low hanging fruit for the Quad because it's routinely you know, mentioned in, in speeches by officials as an area where the Quad can cooperate, um, especially because there is substantial bilateral cooperation between the different nodes of the Quad already particularly between the US and India, um, you know, uh, the have tri services exercise, which are focused on HADR, but also with Japan, uh, which um, the two, two countries have a dialogue as well as have an HADR exercise focused on the Air Force, I think. So I think the benefit for India in working within the Quad is actually uh, burden sharing with regard to tools, equipment, uh, and data, as well as enhancing its knowledge and capabilities through 
the sharing of best practices and experience. And, and each of these countries can actually bring their own comparative advantages and, and assets to bear in helping countries in the Indo-Pacific deal with the, the impact of natural disasters. Um, and I think key areas of cooperation for the Quad countries uh, would be on uh, information and data sharing, uh, joint capacity building uh, or training of countries in the region, and, and joint research on, on disaster management technology, uh, which you know countries like uh, the US and Japan and US and Australia are already pursuing and India could, uh, could join those efforts. Um, there's also may, maybe you know, something that it can be considered is cooperation um, on climate change because uh, natural disasters are induced, uh, we are seeing uh, by climate change effects. And so if these mechanisms can also be used as a forum for uh, dialogue and cooperation on that, and when if these groups can um, try to share um, you know, ideas and best practices on say climate adaptation strategies, uh, that could be helpful as well. I, I know that uh, India has also put forth the idea of um, a coalition on um, the disaster, uh, disaster resilient infrastructure, which uh, includes Australia, France, Japan, and the US as members. And it's essentially meant as a forum for sharing best practices and technical expertise on standards for uh, infrastructure that is uh, resilient. Uh, but we can also have these countries, you know, collaborate together on projects in countries in South Asia or Southeast Asia to meet the, you know, the specific needs of, of, um, of those member countries. So um, I think uh, for me, I would say disaster relief, not only in response to actual disasters, but also considering uh, the whole life cycle, also considering, you know, prevention. Um, and that's why I think maybe, you know, India can even lead conversations on that within the SARC. We've seen that during the, the COVID pandemic, uh, India has tried to restart the SARC disaster management uh, you know, website for information sharing. Uh, but if uh, we can sort of find more uses for at least uh, information sharing and you know, best practices sharing, that could be helpful. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Akriti. I think, uh, I mean, to follow up on, on, uh, on your important points, I think the, what you had mentioned, I think in one of your excellent recent papers, I think last year's, in fact, if I can recommend it, it's called India's Role in Disaster Management, Can the Quad Give It a Leg Up? Uh, There's a chapter, I think, in the largest Simpsons publication um, that came out in 2019. But I agree to me, the question here from India, as you can realize from the discussion we had also before, is A, is the Quad or the Quad Plus, whatever you want to call it, basically also more of a geostrategic device, you know, that is responding to China, that is limiting India's maneuvering ground, if you could address that, A. And then B, I think just recently, I think the U.S. Uh, Navy Secretary is mentioning the possibility of the creation of a new fleet, uh, I think the first fleet, if I'm not mistaken, uh, an indo pacom fleet. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, in one of his declarations, he actually spoke about a subcontinent and disaster response or some type of sort of stability that the U.S. wants to push there. As you can imagine, this will raise alarm bells in some uh, corridors here in Delhi. But uh, if you could speak about, you know, India's options and pros and cons of, you know, looking at this from the sort of military geostrategic angle, um, uh, or the cases you make, I think, very cogently on technology, information sharing that are basically more civilian dimensions to disaster response. Thanks, uh, Dino, for those questions. I think, so uh, the paper that you mentioned that I wrote for Stimson, uh, in that, I actually argue that um, because, uh, particularly from the Chinese perspective, the Quad is seen as potentially a containment strategy or a containment mechanism or a hard security mechanism, it might actually be a good idea for the Quad to begin focusing on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief because then it allows uh, you know, those countries to uh, sort of position this mechanism as uh, cooperation on uh, a larger issue that is common to all, sort of working uh, for uh, the prosperity of all through uh, common cooperation. And it can, um, like I said, generate goodwill. I also think that uh, if, uh, to the point that you were making earlier about concerns about India's uh, response or uh, involvement in the region, if there are any notions among India's neighbors that it's trying to monopolize relief efforts for reputational benefits or for leverage, 
that can actually probably be mitigated by working within the Quad, especially if it is uh, from the point of view of helping nations help themselves. So if it is from the point of view of you know, capacity building or training or providing technology that's, that's common use or having like India is doing you know, with the information fusion center that is providing data, providing a common uh, maritime picture, uh, you know, maybe even looking at a common assessment of disasters across uh, the Indo-Pacific region. Because right now, a lot of the information is siloed in the Indian Ocean region and the Pacific region, it's not really combined. So if you can look at those kinds of mechanisms where you have you know, knowledge sharing or, or load sharing across regions and India can be uh, the one to sort of you know, collate that data, analyze it and, and disseminate it uh, as part of, of the quad. And obviously you know, using the comparative advantages of countries like the US, Australia and Japan, then that could uh, mitigate some of those concerns. Um, I think on the first fleet, I think there's very little still out on that, and I, I wouldn't want to uh, comment on it, but I hope I, I still answered your question. I, Captain Pravar, please go ahead if you want to answer that. I, I thought, that quickly you were going to make a grand announcement that was... Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, if we... Uh, Captain Pravar, yeah, very briefly, I have a question the, for uh, Colonel Katuch coming in. Yeah, okay, just on that, uh, on the first fleet thing, I, I really don't know with the administration changing how many things will actually stay and how many will not stay. And uh, as per the, what I've read is the first fleet is going to be based in Singapore, which is quite a bold move. And uh, there's going to be a lot of response on that a little later on. If there is any effective statement to follow it up after the administration changes, we'll have to watch and wait and see what actually happens. Got it. Thank you. Um, in fact, uh, just to add on, I think uh, uh, Kriti was saying beyond Indo-Pacific, I think just starting in the Bay of Bengal may not be a, ba a bad idea, right? In the immediate neighborhood where these disasters are so frequent, uh, where India could play such a more important role in coordinating regional mechanisms of preventing, right? And preparing for disaster preparedness. Uh, Colonel Katuch, I have a question coming in from Cecile Fruman. I think that's particularly directed for you or you're probably the best equipped person to handle this question. She's a director at the Regional Integration and engagement South Asia program at the World Bank in Washington, DC. So she's looking at the One South Asia program uh, at World Bank. And she's asking, and let me read this out, um, what role do you see India playing in vaccinating South Asia as part of the COVID vaccine or in preparing South Asia as part of the COVID vaccine rollout? Can India take a leading role in that? How can India move from symbolic handouts or vaccines to leading a well-coordinated regional response for the immediate needs and for the future also to build long-term resilience to pandemics and other such risks in India's region? Ah, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I'm not too sure that uh, the Indian government has actually moved into thinking beyond vaccinating its own population yet. And in fact, I, I don't think any government in the world has uh, started thinking about um, should I say, helping neighbors in vaccination. From one point of view, India has the largest capacity to manufacture vaccines. Most certainly that capacity will, or parts of that capacity will be placed at the disposal or not at the disposal of, but will be used to assist our neighboring countries, for sure. I have, I have uh, absolutely no doubt on that. How that works out in terms of priorities, how that works out in terms of the, our own national requirements vis-a-vis uh, -vis our production capacities, I, I think it's just too early to say. Uh, but I, I would definitely be able to state that, um, or, or feel that we would certainly reach out to help our neighbors, definitely. And main, you know, it's so obvious. They don't have a production capacity of this nature. This is the largest emergency that has hit the world in decades. So if then India does not hit, uh, reach out to its neighborhood, then when will it do so? In fact, the foreign secretary in his recent visit to Nepal made the announcement that uh, uh, India will consider, I think Nepali requests uh, with priority and the, the neighborhood will be sort of the first recipient of any possible future uh, vaccine that can be distributed. But Colonel Katuch, I mean, on the on the OCHA front, on these medical uh, you know, or health emergencies, has there been thinking in the past? Is there something India could work more closer with the UN system uh, currently? Because as you, you know, I was just looking at OCHA's presence in India and interactions and 
it mirrors in many ways also the weak UN presence of the Department of Political Affairs, which has never been sort of allowed in, the, in, in India and in the region for the suspicions or the concerns you have mentioned before. But particularly now lo looking towards the future on this particular health emergency, would you see a potential for greater cooperation between India and the UN uh, OCHA office uh, on the response and the vaccination plans in, across the region? I think the OCHA office itself will be supporting WHO. The lead agency in uh, the medical response to the pandemic is WHO. And if there's anyone India should be working with, it is WHO. And I know it's working with it. And I'm sure it will support WHO's uh, program in, in whatever way it can. OCHA is, a, is not a player in terms of coordinating uh, medical response of this nature. I mean, it, uh, it supports WHO. And I know that OCHA has staff sitting with WHO to help them in, in some of these issues. But we, uh, as, in, as a country, would uh, be working closely with WHO, not with OCHA on this issue. Thank you. Sanit, anything you would like to highlight in response before we go to the next round of questions? Uh, any aspect uh, more addressed to you or something you want to weigh in? Uh, uh, no, just wanted to uh, mention that uh, the point regarding uh, internal coordination, that was uh, largely um, the centralization aspect of it was the focus for the paper. Uh, how we can do it is um, is obviously debatable. We can um, look at that more closely. But um, And also um, regarding the quad, um, I think as you mentioned, as everyone here mentioned, it's um, the it's it's benign it's a benign dimension to cooperation or it's there's a soft security dimension to cooperation uh, the geopolitical aspect of it and how it plays out is um, i think um, india australia and japan have their issues currently with, in their bilateral re relations with china so in uh, in in order to sort of uh, make a balancing act between the US and China, this could be an option that to, to further the agenda for cooperation within the Quad. Uh, that's why HADR should be looked at through that sense, in that geopolitical sense. Sanit, if you could maybe pull up the slide on, uh, uh, I think you have one on the civil society engagement, which could be right. interesting also in terms of the complexity. Um, and you have another one on the nature of emergencies. Maybe we can leave that a bit later. But one question, I think, uh, uh, Colonel Katuj, if you could also address this, which is the role of civil society, right? I think this has been studied a lot, but the importance of NGOs, um, regional states, if you want, that have worked almost in parallel to central governments, uh, often contributing relief across the border to India's neighbors, to Nepal and the earthquake, to Bangladesh in terms of the cyclones and Sri Lanka. These are just some of the cases that uh, Sanit uh, um, compiled in terms of Indian civil society organizations that on their own went ahead often. And in fact, the current foreign minister of India, then foreign secretary acknowledged that it's important to rope in these civil society organizations and make it easier for them in cases of emergency to support their counterparts across the border. But that's not always easy given financial constraints and logistical constraints security concerns about civil society stepping up across the border. But if you could bring this up, because I know this is a larger debate about involving civil society in disaster relief worldwide. Okay. No, um, before I address that specific question, I, what troubled me about some of the discussions earlier was the distinguishing between a civil disaster response and a military disaster response as far as the government is concerned. They, they aren't two different things. There's a whole of government response. And the military is just an instrument, one of the instruments utilized for disaster response. Yes, in sudden onset disasters, the military has the inherent advantages of speed and capacity and stuff of that sort. But it is just one instrument. The, uh, the issue of civil society is extremely important. Uh, within our own country, um, we have a huge amount of capacity in terms of civil society organizations. The Indian Red Cross is the largest Red Cross society in the world. It has more than 1 million members. Most governments across the world provide humanitarian assistance through their own Red Cross societies. Why don't we? There is very little interaction between MEA and the Indian Red Cross. 
So that leads to what you're saying. Until we start acknowledging the fact that our own civil society and NGOs and the Red Cross have capacities which can be utilized both domestically and internationally, we won't take that step that you are talking about of coordinating their functions. Uh, don't forget that uh, the government really does not have a lien on civil society. They do it on their own, whether it's uh, within the country or uh, to a neighboring country. What we can do is create a environment and a coordination infrastructure in which that is not just random shots at what they're doing, but towards a common end. And for that, we need to definitely involve them a lot more in some of the decision-making processes. Thank you, Colonel Katuch. Um, we have several very good questions coming in. Um, so let me, let's try to do it uh, a few more brief uh, sort of rapid fire questions to some of you more directed. I think Captain Parmar, one question in particular for you uh, from Asanga Abayagunesekara in uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, he's asking that the recent, for example, the recent empty new diamond oil tanker rescue by India and Sri Lanka was a huge success story between India and Sri Lanka in terms of cooperating on that risk of a major oil spill. Sri Lanka is well positioned geographically for this sort of future operations in the Indian Ocean region, in the Bay of Bengal, as a neutral partner. So he asked, what are the prospects of setting up a regional center in Sri Lanka for HADR? Probably a bit more on the naval maritime damage. If, if you are to set up uh, regional centers, then the first is, again, what is the aim of this regional center? Is it for sharing of information? Is it going to be coordinating uh, efforts. So therefore, it's not going to be, I would say, particular to one nation. It will have to be, uh, you'll have to have people from everywhere manning that sort of a organization. And that is going to be a little difficult because uh, disasters may come, may not come. So one is, how do you set up that uh, regional center? And if it's going to be uh, nationwide, then you you will need to have several of these regional centers may be manned by the uh, by that particular nation in a place where it can be accessed. You will have the, uh, what do you call, the um, infrastructure to house more people when it has to be up and running. So not only for Sri Lanka, you, we can look at it and putting it in various places, especially when India is one example, Sri Lanka is another. You could look at Bangladesh also. You could look at Myanmar. You could look at uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia. If you look at this whole area, then let's look at the east coast of Africa. But the question is the funding part. It will add to the uh, cost of setting up uh, an establishment which will be used not frequent, hopefully not frequently. I mean, that's one wish we would have. So these are issues that need to be looked at. So if you look at a regional center, then what is the aim is the first place? Who's going to look at the funding? Who all will man it? And what is the connectivity? Mm -hmm. So I'm not too sure whether many nations would agree to it because you already have established, we, have, we already have, say, we have our own uh, national organization for defense man or for uh, disaster management. So that one way is a center in itself. You can have it already in an existing establishment and have people from uh, all over the place will congregate together when the need is required. So that's something, if it has to be done, then it has to be within an already set up establishment that can be looked at. Absolutely. But I think that the, 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 of course, the importance of bridging the gap of regional mechanisms is there. And I think that's an important issue that needs to be addressed. And if I remember right, the former prime minister of Sri Lanka, Ranil Vikramasinghe, actually mentioned the importance of a code of conduct in the Bay of Bengal, for example, for shipping, maritime routes, etc., sure, sure. which could be related in terms of prevention, information sharing also. And the question obviously being, why should India also be always at the heart of these initiatives uh, and not delegate some of these two countries that are somehow have some comparative advantage, which Sri Lanka certainly has in the Indian Ocean region. That, that is true. So you can look at it. At, there are already uh, discussions at various levels. Iora looks at it. And IONS looks at it. So the whole of the Indian Ocean, in a way, is already covered. It's just a question of seeing who has what capacity and capability, and uh, it can be done. That's not an issue at all. So. Two questions maybe for uh, you, Akriti, um, related in some ways. One by At Atul Koshik. He's saying, should capacity building on any disaster response, whether preparation, training, prevention, and actual response, shouldn't it be demand-driven, particularly in such a sensitive area, right? Is this something you really want to push, uh, or is this something that you want to be prepared to deliver? 
um, an important, dis a small distinction, but I think an important distinction given the sensitivities between India and its neighbors. Related to that, another question for you from an anonymous attendee. Uh, while technology sharing for disasters is primarily civilian cooperation, isn't it underpinned and facilitated by military agreements? And isn't there a role for the military to play in these? I think Captain Parra made an important case for the importance uh, or for the centrality of the military in any initial response. How does this help the image of the Quad again? I mean, a bit of the question of the militarization of the Quad, I think that you could address. Thank you, Dino, and thanks for those questions. Um, yeah, I think in, in the paper uh, that I wrote for Simpson, I did discuss the potential um, concerns that might arise if India works with some of the Western countries, particularly because uh, India is, is very concerned, as Anita's pointed out, about ensuring the territorial sovereignty of countries and waiting for the host country to invite um, that help in. I think um, in, in sort of the cooperation that I was mentioning as well, um, I would I would think that it would be invited by uh, by the host countries and not it would be available for um, you know a deployment or or use by by countries when they request and are not necessarily um, you know that country's bargain with that on on the point of does um, you know the quad doing um, HADR give a sense of militarization. I think you know certain capabilities are only available with militaries. I mean, you you can't things like you know search and rescue. Those kinds of abilities are not available by um, by you know civilian agencies. So um, especially if you have a calamity of the scale that the Indian Ocean tsunami was in you know December two thousand four, you wouldn't think of that as having a, a malign intention if you do you know come in and help in that situation and. I think there are ways to mitigate it. You can coordinate with the UN. You can do it kind of under a UN banner uh, to make countries comfortable. I would say again, I think some of this is you, you kind of have to test the utility of the quad in this, and maybe you don't have to do you know uh, operations in the same way. Maybe you can, uh, or sort of you know side by side. Maybe you can do things in parallel. Maybe you can start slowly and focus more, like I was saying, on capacity building and um, you know. A development of uh, disaster technology first and before going into um, a really sort of the, the more militaristic aspects of it. So uh, I think a lot of this will depend on the response of countries uh, in the region and, and how much they believe this is beneficial. Uh, so I, I think that point is, is well taken. Exactly. In fact, on, on under India's ITEC program, uh, Indian Technical and Economic Partnerships um, for Capacity Building, I think even this year already, several uh, capacity building and training initiatives have already happened to support uh, neighboring countries uh, uh, to respond to these emergencies and to the current pandemic in particular. So I think that would be possibly one, one solution, right? That rather than the military to military defense diplomacy, you already have uh, India playing a very important role uh, through the ITEC program in terms of capacity building. But uh, from uh, Captain Parmar, if I may come back to you, a question from your a fellow from the Air Force. Uh, we have the Army here, we have the Navy, but the Air Force was missing. Air Vice Marshal Manmohan Bahadur uh, has a long comment. I, I think you can see it uh, and you can look at it more personally, but I, I'll, I'll read out the main, I think, question that is really int interesting, that the new uh, inter headquarters of the Integrated Defense Staff now, in particular, new, uh, we have new, a new CDS now that is playing a more um, central role in coordinating and integrating the three services. Um, is there, the MEA is represented it, uh, uh, in it now, but obviously initial requirement would come through the MEA, but what is the role of the CDS and of the IDS headquarters in any future uh, of these operations? And that coordination, how is it happening and how could it become better? I think the main aim of a centralized coordination is to ensure that you uh, we put our assets to proper use. There's no wastage of, uh, of assets per se. And so if you have one centralized coordination office looking at it and organizing and realizing with ME and others, they said, let's, let's just create a scenario. This is a nation that's hit by a disaster. And our mission on ground says this is the requirement, comes through ME, it goes to this particular office. And then based on that, the office will decide what are the number of ships, what are the number of aircraft, and what number of people we need to put on ground along with the equipment. And then the three services pitch in and they provide whatever it is. And therefore, then the assets move out. That, in a nutshell, is how ideally the system should move. 
So if you have something like this centralized, and I'm not too sure with the DMA because I'm uh, not too okay with the establishment. I don't know how the establishment is or the chain is right now. I think it's still settling down. But I think HQ, whichever be the coordinating office, it doesn't matter. As long as it's got the right people from the right offices sitting there with the ability to reach out and coordinate the efforts. And I said it has to be on time and it has to be meaningful and it has to be the right amount with the right equipment to go in the right place. As long as that is achieved, any central coordinating office can work in that aspect. HQ Ideas used to do it earlier. I'm not sure with DMA coming in, will the responsibility shift or will it stay with HQ Ideas? To my mind, I think it should stay with HQ Ideas. And again, the importance of domain expertise, even within the Department of Military Affairs, right? Which would be required uh, rather than having a constant rotation in and out of officers that uh, uh, need to yes. sort of uh, re re relearn the process. But what about capabilities, Captain Parman? If I may stay uh, two minutes more with you, I think on uh, Air Vice Marshal Manmohan Badud mentions the importance of the Iluchin 76 and new assets uh, uh, by the Indian Air Force. There's another question uh, speaking about the importance of um, capabilities in terms of landing ships, tankers, uh, LPDs need to need, you need these LPDs to complement our HADR capability. If you could speak about the current capability uh, before we go back to the civilian domain within the Navy and the Air Force in particular, uh, is it sufficient? I remember your articles from 10 years ago making the case that India's military modernization plans and capability acquirements need to be shift, need to take into consideration also these types of expeditionary uh, relief and support for other countries. Uh, are the current capabilities enough? I, I don't think you can actually put it whether it's enough or not, because it would depend upon the timing of the disaster. And if it comes unannounced, and uh, you can prepare as much as you want. We all know this. But each disaster will have a different requirement. It will have a different sort of an organization up and running. But having said that, uh, well, we need more assets. And remember, these are all dual nature type of assets. Essentially, we got Jalashwa, the LPD from uh, US with the idea of the lesson we learned from the 2004 tsunami. But of course, uh, there's been a long layoff. We haven't got any more LPTs. The Navy is looking at uh, uh, buying, uh, buying up, uh, purchasing new LPTs. But it's been, uh, it's been a long delay. Again, I understand that there is going to be a fresh look at uh, procurement of LPTs. So to say whether you have enough capacity or capability, again, would see again it depends upon where has the disaster taking place. If it's near your coast shoreline, then the, the ships which you have are adequate. But if it's long, and to give an example, for example, the COVID pandemic. pandemic. If you need to keep supporting nations or, or you need to support each other and you move people out here and there, then you need to have ships moving in and out continuously. And ships have their own uh, routine of running. What a figure is difficult to say. But if you ask me, I said, yes, we do need more LPDs. Numbers, I, I cannot guess out here right now. Got it. And uh, aircraft, again, we need because, uh, as I say, we have a very uh, active western border and now the eastern border has become livelier. So we need to have our assets equally balanced. And plus, do remember, we also send assets for UN missions. So there is going to be a lot of, um, what would I say, uh, calculations done as to how much of a force would you like to keep for HADR? Can you pull it out from normal operations? How will you rotate them around? And this is where the coordination office would actually right. come into play. Right. Uh, another interesting uh, point, suggestion from Dr. Uday Banu Singh at uh, the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. He says that beyond capacity building, it would be important to also have Indian support for seismology centers in the Indian Ocean region in terms of prevention of, of future tsunamis, or at least early warning systems uh, in terms of the earthquakes and that could devastate also the subcontinent. Um, one excellent question, I think, Sanit, you could just walk us through maybe in one minute is uh, the importance of controlling a hyperactive media. Uh, we lost out big time, this is again from Air Vice Marshal Manmohan Badur, in Nepal, despite all our efforts. If you could just in one minute explain what happened in Nepal. I think you spoke also to Ambassador Ranjit Rai, who at that time was uh, heading the Indian mission in Kathmandu. But if you could explain why the brownie points at the domestic level actually turned into sour grapes in Nepal. Right. Um, yes, uh, the coverage, Indian media's coverage of uh, India's relief efforts in Nepal was a huge problem. Uh, I mean, initially, the coverage started off with uh, all covering all relief efforts, but uh, in time, it sort of tended towards focusing only on um, India's efforts and how India is, was evacuating uh, Indian civilians. Uh, 
um, that sort of left a bad taste in a lot of uh, Nepali viewers. Uh, also, the fact that there was a lack of sensitivity uh, in the reporters themselves who were on ground and who were covering this event. So uh, what uh, Ambassador Rai told me was he had to go, up, go on a counteroffensive in that sense to uh, sort of uh, push back on that uh, um, uh, sort of uh, coverage. And he had to uh, um, address media he decided to address the media every day from then on to give regular updates on what exactly was happening on ground and what India's uh, assets were uh, employed in to, throughout the relief efforts. Thank you, Sunil. I think that speaks to the importance of the sensitivity again in the relationship. Colonel Katuj, please. On this issue, I mean, I was in Nepal uh, uh, during this entire period, and of course, he's right on the sensitivity factor, but it also leads us to another thought. Uh, within the government of India and the responding agencies of the Indian government to international disasters, how much media training do we give them? I don't think we give them any media training. And frankly, at least when I was with the United Nations and we used to respond to disasters, we did our level best to give everybody formal media training. And you need to do that because in today's world of social media, TV, mobile phones, which are taking photos, um, you have to be able to give out a point of view which is factual and accurate. So it's it's only partially correct to blame the Indian media and say, oh, they became jingoistic. All media become jingoistic. If you watch the coverage of a disaster in the United States where the US is responding, it'll only be covering the US teams. Of course it will. Or some other country, naturally, because that's what their public wants to know. But what we uh, haven't uh, sort of, should I say, stressed on in case we want to moderate this kind of thing is our own official briefings. I mean, they were non-existent during the uh, Nepal earthquake until, as he says, the Indian M slacked somewhat and started doing it. So there's a little lacuna within ourselves. And my suggestion for uh, that was, that the other thing which we in India have not been doing, which most major donor countries do when they respond abroad, is they send a small team to support the embassy and the ambassador out there from the capital. And this team consists of, it's like in the US, they call it a dark team. Similar thing was going from the UK or JICA or whatever. It consists of a humanitarian specialist, a media specialist and a military specialist. Only then, because, you know, there are dozens of embassies abroad, the capacities that they have are so varying. So you have to have the ability to do this. And that, that also caters for some of these issues that uh, come up on, on uh, disaster response. Excellent suggestion, uh, uh, sir, on the, again, preparedness of having teams and ex experts in place that uh, follow these. And again, like you mentioned, these are wheels that keep turning. And every two, three years, we have a major catastrophe, unfortunately, in, in the subcontinent and beyond uh, that are ready to support uh, the then sort of tactical structures and, and deployments yeah. that happen, right? Um, and that makes the case, again, for an interagency thinking at the highest level, I would say, with political buy-in uh, to create that. Whether in NEA, I think in that sense, is not even the main question, right? The question is, you need uh, uh, how to, not where, but uh, how to develop this, this expertise. So yeah. I think uh, one thing, uh, Sanit, I won't, uh, Professor Ban Seng Tan at Ashoka University, you can see his comments and I, I, I encourage you to look at them. He has excellent questions on, on the data and suggestions also to look at this, uh, whether to aid data to William and Mary College that looks at uh, aid budgets, um, or I think the OECD credit reporting system. He's saying also that may be useful to compare India's budget with the OECD reporting system. Though I think your answer probably will be that the India simply does not report. I think Colonel Katoch mentioned, I think something in this regard also that India generally is not part of many of these international initiatives, does not report and should do a better job at that. But let's finish in the last, next five minutes, if with your permission, with one last slide, Sanit, which is the, the range of emergencies. I think Colonel Katoch, you mentioned rightly that there are apples and oranges in terms of the types of crises that are addressed. But the point really being that bottom line, any type of major crisis um, 
India needs to be prepared to respond within the first hours. So whether it's a, and we have to think of new types of crises. This is a table that uh, Sanit put together. We got excellent feedback from many people um, just on sort of thinking out of the box of what can and could happen in future. A range of emergencies that go beyond the traditional way we look at natural calamities and HADR. And my question to each three of you sort of on a final note would be, if you had one suggestion to the Prime Minister of India or the External Affairs Minister, um, I think some of them we shared already, but if you could zoom down on one actionable item that India could take to be able to deploy faster, better, more efficiently in its neighborhood to support any neighboring country facing one of these tragedies, um, what would that be? Um, who wants to start? I'll go first on this if Colonel Katoji, your permission, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. You know, one thing which we have in abundance in India is capability. And this is where the distinction must be understood between capacity and capability. We have the capability of addressing all sorts of, uh, or whatever is the list out here, I just ran through it. Most of them, um, I would say now all of them in some way or the other of the capability of addressing these uh, challenges. Capacity is the issue. The capacity would entail in this uh, specific aspect is the ability to ensure the capability reaches in the shortest possible time. Whether it's by road, whether it's by air, or whether it's by sea. And in that case, as Colonel Katoj said, it has to be an, an all uh, government approach. It's not only the military, if you look uh, by air, you can uh, rope in the airlines. We did get Air India for our airlift from uh, Kuwait. And for those of you who remember, it is the second largest airlift after the Berlin airlift. And perhaps the first or the largest uh, airlift of people out from a country. You can get uh, the Shipping Corporation of India. You, know, you can get uh, your uh, road transportation going. We have the capability, but the capacity has to be increased. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Captain Parmar. Uh, and th the range, of course, um, is important. I'd like your, your approach in terms of finding the right capabilities and deploying them, right? Um, India has capabilities uh, in terms of intelligence on terror attacks, in terms of cyber attacks to respond, to share this with the neighboring countries and to support them to respond to these various uh, attacks. But Colonel Kadoj, I wonder if this list is too unorthodox for you. Is it too... Is it, is it mixing too many apples and oranges? Uh, or do you agree that in general, whatever the crisis is that Sri Lanka has tomorrow, it's a major crisis. It doesn't have the capabilities to respond. It requests Indian support. And if India doesn't come in within the next 48 hours, another country will come in and deliver the technical expert know-how to respond to that specific crisis. Yeah, I mean, uh, what Captain Pama said is right. We have the capacity, we have the capabilities. We have the experts. What we don't have is an internal system that puts it all together in a, in a very short while to project it. And I think uh, if, as you said, if there's one suggestion I would have to make to, to the powers that be, it is let's sit down together and have a frank discussion that if this is a priority for this country, what do we need to do internally to, to operationalize it? And that will need a change in mindset. And I'll just give you an example. The, the national disaster plan of this country of 2016 has 162 pages. There is one line on international disaster response. The same national disaster plan of 2019 has 384 pages and there's one page on disaster response internationally. That to dealing with how do we accept international assistance. So a whole mindset change is required. Thank you very much, Colonel Katoj. I think I'd, I'd add a uh, few other people than you would be more capable in terms of uh, uh, steering this discussion towards concrete solutions and, and an actual roadmap in terms of uh, better coordination at the institution level. Uh, Sanit, I, just, I can't resist saying that uh, from the Ashoka professor, uh, the comment includes a mention that your report seems to be based on primary sources, which absolutely is a compliment and, and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I think that is the work that you've done exhaustively and is very important. Uh, but Sadiq, is there anything you would also like to add in terms of what you think of the many recommendations you've made is the most important priority? Uh, 
uh, in the sense that uh, I what I felt from uh, talking to a few experts and uh, uh, the people that I uh, talked to about this, uh, the main issue that came up was uh, lack of coordination itself. I mean, uh, we talked about this a lot and uh, Kanil Katoj and everyone else also talked about this. But um, I mean, yes, there will be uh, military assets that will need to be deployed because there's capabilities in that sense. Uh, and we can't make do without only by just building up on civilian capabilities. But um, this, the mindset change that um, uh, uh, Colonel Katoch was talking about, that how there has been little focus on what we can do with regards to HADR externally and how we can use it better for uh, building leverage or not leverage, but uh, building goodwill uh, within the neighborhood. Uh, is not looked at as much as it should be. And that is that was the primary takeaway for me also uh, from the various discussions that I had. Thank you, Sunit. And again, I think uh, when some of the speakers were pushing you to be more geostrategic or geopolitical, uh, I take the blame for telling Sunit, don't go into that larger aspect. We have Akriti and many other good people working on that. Uh, but Sunit's marching orders were to really do this primary evidence-based work on sort of compiling what India has done over the last 20 years and, uh, and segmenting it. And these are in many ways these primers under the Samban initiative. We're trying to bring that, try to synthesize a complex issue in the neighborhood in, in four or 5,000 words. Akriti, uh, you woke up the first of all of us. So you get also the, the, the last but most important word in terms of what could, what you would like to see uh, India doing more uh, to be able to respond quicker, faster, and more efficiently to its neighbors in a variety of emergencies. Thanks, Dino. I think I'll, I'll take off from uh, what um, everybody has said, and I think just focus kind of on the hyper-specific, which is maybe doing uh, mock drills uh, in, in the embassies of you know, countries in the region to respond to something like this, having a communications plan, having a coordination plan, who to call, what to do, you know, besides sort of the broader policies and, and plans that, that, you know, Captain Parma and Colonel Katoch and Sunit were talking about, but having, um, having regular ways of updating that, of having those communication plans, you know, that training, those mock drills in place where you are not, you know, reacting, but you're being proactive in, in planning for contingencies like this. Thank you. And I think uh, no other institution better prepared to do that than the NDMA, which does it right and domestically and is prepared to do it with many organizations and has been doing it. And why not do this at the missions abroad uh, and at the, at the uh, where, where Indian diplomats are constantly facing these crises? And frankly, I'll be, you know, I, I think Sunny, you heard a lot of this from people that are sort of saying everything is fine. We do this very well. We've pulled it off fantastically and nothing needs to be done up to very frank assessments from people that tell you also privately, um, we keep reinventing the wheel. We keep uh, spending resources and do it well, but at a huge cost, human costs, financial costs for India, technical costs, and sometimes bilateral costs to the relationships as in the case of Nepal with some negative elements. So certainly there is scope for your particular suggestions that of practice makes perfect and, and more of these drills and training uh, and preparedness. Well, I think we'll end here. We're uh, just above our time, 6.10. So I want to thank uh, all of you, uh, in particular the three uh, guest speakers, Colonel Katoch, Captain Parmad, uh, Akriti Vazudeva from uh, Stimson for joining us and sharing your views, your, uh, your suggestions on how to take this forward. Sunny, thanks for putting this all together and bringing us here in your, your publication. Hopefully this is not the end. We think of these primers as the beginning of a longer research right. and a deeper research that certainly is warranted for this issue uh, that is, remains really understudied. And I think of great policy interest, Colonel Katush, to your question whether there is political will. I think the interest and the mindset change is there, but uh, the capacity or the expertise is missing. And hopefully we can bridge that at CSEP through our research and with your and uh, Captain Parmar's and many other practitioners that ha have extensive experience in this um, to push the needle towards better policy. So thank you all. Thanks for the participants for joining us all. Um, and a final note of, of uh, uh, gratitude also to the Australian High Commission uh, and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Australia that uh, supports a lot of our work on connectivity, on regional issues, on the Indian Ocean region, 
and constantly supports uh, our, our research um, on this particular front uh, in terms of regional connectivity. Thank you all and hope to host you again soon at CSEP. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Be safe. Take care. Thank you.